importance of greater oversight and the inevitability of crypto regulation. Okay, good morning everybody. My name is Mark. I work for Zeroff, which is a trusted, transparent crypto gateway based out of Switzerland. And we're going to talk about the importance and inevitability of regulation in crypto. We're going to do this in a relatively quick fire, rapid rounds uh, with my three esteemed panelists. And I'm going to ask you each to introduce yourselves when I come to you, if you don't mind. So, Robert, the first topic goes to you. And with everything that's been going on recently, a thought came through my mind, which is, aren't we rewriting the headlines at the moment. I could see a headline instead of crypto is bad and crypto causes challenges in the market. And the new headline could go something like this. Fractional reserve banking causes contagion in the crypto markets. And my question to you is, aren't we in a bit of a real mess at the moment from a regulatory and an oversight perspective? We have the European Commission who have recently been on a global roadshow selling Mika saying that FTX would not have happened in Europe because of Mika. Perhaps Mika should have been applied to US banks, Robert. What do you think? Hello? Oh, great. Um, yeah, that's a lot of good questions. Hi, everyone, by the way. Um, the question about Mika, I think, is very interesting because uh, Europe as an economic region uh, took a leap in a very early, at a very early stage to come up with regulation that I think will move the, the whole sector forward quite a lot. And um, I think, and we just had the US Congress delegation in Brussels, uh, hosted them discussing, you know, like crypto regulation, what is it for, why we need it, et cetera, et cetera. And basically every congressman, senator asked, like, would we have prevented uh, FTX with Mika? And the answer is, Yes, if they would have played by the rules, right? So regulation is only as good as, as the participation and the buy-in is, and the buy-in that you get depends on how good the regulation is, right? So I'm a big fan of public-private partnerships when it comes to creating regulation. You know, the regulators have their agenda, central banks have their agenda, but in the end, it has to be good for the innovators and the consumers, right? If it doesn't work for them, then what's the purpose? So I think... Um, if you have companies that are willing to participate and join and give their expertise to create sane and positive innovation-friendly regulation, then they will buy into it, they will use regulation, they will go where the regulation is, and that will improve the whole system. And therefore, I think situation like FTX can be prevented. If there's a criminal that does criminal things and doesn't want to be part of the game, then regulation will not help as well. So that's it, I think, in a nutshell. Thanks, Robert, uh, and thank you for taking the awkward question. Joseph, I'd, I'd like to come on to you now. So with your experience of looking at regulatory packages, particularly from the base that you're from in Malta, I know that you work around the world, but Malta was very early in developing a regulatory framework for crypto. In fact, at one time, Malta was viewed as the blockchain island. And I remember being at this very event in, in Malta, in, I think it was 2018, in the Intercontinental Hotel, where there were, what, seven, 8,000 people there talking about crypto as well as gaming. Um, why? Why on earth do crypto markets need regulation? Because there's an element of the crypto market that says, insert very rude words, regulation. So I always start, like to start, and as a former regulator, it can come back to bite me, but I always like to start by saying that regulation is a necessary evil. So uh, ideally, in an ideal world, we shouldn't have regulation. We should have self-regulation, but self-regulation does not work. So, and it has been proved time and time again, because you'll have some good players and some good actors that will abide by the self-regulation, but you will always find those bad actors that will actually not abide, and then they create a vortex um, uh, effect by actually sucking up all the resources of uh, the big operators, the serious operators that are trying to play by the rules. And then automatically the big operators say, well, we're not competitive anymore. We need to uh, do what the others are doing. So ultimately, regulation, yes, unfortunately, is a necessary evil. 
Now, that also means that uh, um, uh, regulation has to be done in a very careful way. So one has to find a way how to create a balance, the right balance between properly regulating something, but also at the same time allowing innovation to be made in, in, in these industries. Um, because ultimately, um, when you create too much regulation, you're stifling automatically innovation, whether you want it or not. It is automatic. It is automatic. Now, ultimately, uh, Malta was the first country, probably together with uh, Abu Dhabi, actually, ironically, um, in 2018, to uh, regulate properly um, uh, crypto service providers, or VASPs, as they are called today, virtual asset service providers. And uh, Ironically, at the time, in the beginning, everyone in 2016-17 was calling Malta the blockchain island because it was really putting effort in regulating crypto. But at the same time, what happened afterwards is that they come up with a framework that was very, very tough compared to all the rest of the jurisdictions. And what happened is that uh, ultimately, um, uh, Many operators said, look, why should I go to Malta and get regulated at this level when I can go to Estonia, where I can go to some other jurisdiction and get regulated at this level? So ultimately, um, many chose to go elsewhere. But a few decided to keep sticking to their guns and, come and remain in Malta and get a license in Malta. And actually, um, it, it worked for the simple reason that now Mika is basically identical to the Maltese regulation. So what's going to happen now is those operators that have a license from Malta, the day that Mika comes into force, they will hand back their Malta license and get a Mika license. And by the afternoon, they can passport their services. So actually, it paid for them, um, passporting is what will basically be allowed under Mika in order to be able to offer your services all over the EU. So what happens now is those 15 or maybe in the coming months will have 20, 25 licensees are going to have a massive advantage over their competitors. Thank you for that. So we've heard from a, Robert, can I call you a, a, a lobbyist? <laughs> um, excuse me for that. We've heard from uh, an ex-regulator and an advisor. Yanislav, I'd like to hear from an innovator's perspective. Where are some of the frictions when we look at regulation that particularly frustrate you as an innovator, as an entrepreneur who's building code, creating projects? Friction. So the more you innovate, the less regulation can be applied because regulators obviously always follow the innovation. So if you're really, really doing something completely new, there's no law and no regulator who can even follow what you're doing. So um, the more you innovate, the less it becomes interesting. But of course, for the mainstream market, it's not so much anymore about innovation. It's more about execution and having good practices and security and uh, like lots of these standard things which are just universally applicable to, let's say, lots of industries or businesses. And here, I think the crypto industry is still maturing, meaning it's becoming mainstream as we are speaking now, but um, still not mainstream. Um, and yeah, there's still lots of space to, to innovate and lots of laws and um, regulation needs to be still um, also actually invented or um, come up with. Um, it's uh, for sure not that we can take the existing banking regulation and just apply it to crypto. That's exactly not the point. Maybe we should make it even illegal that other people have private keys of other people. This would solve so many uh, problems. If self-custody becomes um, a rule or a law, self-custody, and not anymore um, trusting other people, then I think we need less rest regulation, a completely different regulation than what is there for the financial industry. Yeah, that's what I think. So the, the topic of self-custody is super interesting because if we look at what's been going on in the US recently with the, the unfortunate situation around banks, the, the run on banks is largely caused because people have a concern about the value that the banks are holding and, and whether they're going to be able to access it. So this concept of self-custody 
where you're acting as your own bank, you have immediate control of your assets is super fascinating because I know it worries regulators and governments a lot. So to, to that point is, is the increasing uh, amount of regulation and oversight and inevitability in our market with the events that have recently happened? Do you think there's going to be a huge amount more of regulation and oversight and involvement from governments and government entities? Depends if you, um, even if it's a um, dictatorian government or a statist um, mindset, then yes. Um, but in case you follow the democracy or um, democratic principles, then for sure you want to empower people to make their own decisions. You want to give them more power. So you want to um, enable them to do self-custody because it's fundamentally more secure than trusting other people in case you have essentially the the power to um, own your assets in reality um, because right now it's not the case with your paper money or not even with your passport. It's the case the passport is a property of your government um, as far as I know. But uh, maybe somebody wants to correct me. But um, its identity is obviously also something which needs to um, be um, kind of like um, revolutionized in the new digital future or now which we have but um, still we are um, using like um, the paper world. So, um, um, yeah, to, to answer your question, um, we need more innovation, still a lot, I think. It's, uh, it's not mainstream yet, and it's no, um, um, I mean, there will be governments which are working in, in different directions, but yeah. um, I think in the free world or in the Western world, um, we want um, self-custody and this is, this is the future. Let's bring Robert back in. I can see that he's uh, leaning forwards, wanting to get in here. Robert, inevitability. It is increasing regulation and oversight and inevitability that we just have to live with? What do you think? I mean, looking at how the, I mean, I can speak just from a European perspective. Um, um, how, how regulators operate, they're, they're they're event-driven, right? If there's nothing bad happening, nobody cares, everything's fine, there will be no regulation coming out. But unfortunately, lately in the last 12, 18 months, a lot of things happened that drove a lot of people out of their policy holes, especially in the US. In Europe, it's a bit better because we started earlier, so there was less opportunity for damage. And also, I think a lot of our regulators are very well educated by now that uh, they understood that don't overreact, have a look. See what, see what it means and, and then learn from it, right? So the mistake policymakers often do is like they just react without thinking like, is this a new thing? Is this part of a process? Because it's a growing young industry, right? There will be mistakes, there will be things broken. And just because of that, you just don't start screaming and running around like a headless chicken and try to do something. You, th you think it through, you discuss it with the participants. And that's what we, for example, try to do to give them insight, give them additional expertise that they don't have access to. And I think there will be more regulation. It's not inevitable, but um, it's, it's all about the quality of the regulation, right? It's, if it makes sense and it helps the industry to grow, protect consumers and investors, then I think it makes sense. But it can't be opposed. I mean, it can't be basically put on top of people that are building. It should be discussed with them so that there's a, a coherent approach to it, right? Like, as you yeah. just said, it's, it's, it's about the innovators that drive the process and how to help them innovate, right? And not to prevent them and then see what's left. Absolutely. So that's the key point. Absolutely. So we're going to start wrapping up here. Uh, uh, just a, a final thought from Zeroff's perspective before I come to Joseph to, to ask you for your closing thoughts, Joseph. Zeroff chose Switzerland in our early days because that was where the clearest regulatory framework existed and where the banks had a good level of understanding and the regulator really well educated. Uh, with that said, Joseph, as an ex-regulator, I wonder if you could sum up your final thoughts and then, Robert, I'm going to come to you and ask you for three words to sum up your thoughts on this, just three words, and then Yanis left to you for three words. Joseph. Well, not much to add from what we all said here, but ultimately, um, uh, uh, picking up a bit on what Jaroslav was saying, so self-custody. Well, in an ideal world, yes, we should go for self-custody, for example, but what is the problem with regulation? That regulation looks at other facets. 
So, for example, one of the main issues with self-custody is lack of control from an AML perspective. So what are they doing? They're actually doing the opposite. They're actually favoring custodial um, uh, solutions rather than allowing people to actually um, hold their cryptocurrencies in a wallet. And that is the main issue with regulation because their biggest worry is not that people lose their money, ironically, but rather uh, their biggest worry is that the people will actually make use of cryptocurrencies to loan their funds. So that is where the balance has to be found in regulation. Super, thank you, Joseph. So we're all out of time. Robert, three words to sum up your thoughts. Engagement. I think the industry needs to engage with regulators. That's very important. I think um, openness towards regulators is important, right? They're not trying to make your life harder. They try to do the right thing. Sometimes they don't know the context and they don't have the experience and the expertise, but that's because they don't get it from anywhere else than the industry, right? And the last thing I think is patience. We need to have patience with this industry. It's new, it's young, it's growing. People don't know what the end result will be and where we're heading to. There's ideas, there's visions, but I think it's really important to give it time, give it space, and, and then I think we all will win. Super, thank you. That was more than three words. Yanislav. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Super. Uh, listen, we were Zeroff, moderating my wonderful colleagues. If you want to know about Switzerland, Swiss on off ramp, come see us. We're just outside. And these three wonderful panelists are going to be hovering around all day. Thank you for your time, everybody. Have a great show. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.